The Bible says eat processed, bleached, modified sugar, right? No, it says eat thou honey because it's good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to the taste. Why does the Bible tell you to eat honey? Because honey is natural. The Bible will never tell you to eat something unnatural. Why, why does our people rule the world for getting our foot cut off? What race has the highest blood pressure? Highest cholesterol? Who, who in our race doesn't know somebody in their family that's on insulin? What if we followed the do's and the don'ts that God gave us? What if we followed the do's and the don'ts that God gave us for our own benefit, for his own temple? Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. Heal in every heart. Bring it together. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Today I was going to start off with naming a bunch of new diets and new fads that's going on. But instead, I am going to just stick with the word of God because I realize that all of these new fads and all of these new diets, it, it's not the same thing as what I want to talk about today. Today, I want to show you that God does have guidelines. He does have laws. He does have judgments. He does have commandments. He does have statutes. And he has those to govern our behavior. So when we pray, we pray, Lord, let your will be done. When we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. When we think and pray, we want God to rest and rule and abide in our lives. But we have to understand that God has a standard for everything that we do, including how we dress, including how we act. The scriptures are full of thou shalt and thou shalt not. Why do we think that God, God who cares if we dress modest or not, God who cares if we tell a lie out of our mouth, God who cares and governs in, in every affair of our life, the God that governs and knows what we think, and he, he tells us what we should be thinking about, how can we possibly think that that same God doesn't care what we put in our body? If God dwells in you, your body immediately becomes a temple. If God dwells in you, the dwelling place of the almighty God is your body. Nah. We know God would never dwell in an unclean vessel. That's why we have to repent. That's why we have to allow the blood of Yahshua and the word of God to cleanse us spiritually. But what about the outside? If you don't take care of the temple, your spirit and your soul will not have a place to live. So then, where will the Lord dwell? If you don't take care of the temple, where will the Lord dwell? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 clearly tells you your body doesn't belong to you. It starts off by asking a question as if you should know this already. It says, what? Know you not? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? And you are not your own. He's asking, don't you know you are not your own? That your body doesn't belong to you. Your body does not belong to you. It is the dwelling place of God. We need to take care of it. Not just to the best of our ability only, but we need to match the instructions for this machine we live in. God's commandments are not grievous. God's commandments are not hard. It's actually easy, pretty easy, especially concerning what we put in our bodies and what we do with it. Those are easy. God wants us to be happy. Did you know it's actually beneficial to eat with family and friends? That's why there's a commandment for us to break bread when we fellowship. Not just fellowship, but God commands us to break bread. God does not want us eating nasty, bland food. How would that make you happy? If that's God's design for you to eat food that you don't even like. Jeremiah 7, 3 says, Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. There are some things we can do differently. There are some things we can do differently that has a huge benefit on your quality of life. Like, or such as not overeating and eating at the right time and the proper way to prepare your meals. These are things that we can easily change and adjust and amend. We learn from Proverbs that pleasant words are as a honeycomb. It's sweet to your soul and health to the bones. 
and merry and a merry heart is like medicine, but a non merry heart dries your bones. That's why you should create a happy atmosphere with your dinner in your own home. So stop eating on the couch in front of the TV. Get your kids off their de their devices and find out how their day went. Sit down with your family. Enjoy a few minutes, a nice good 30 minutes or a good hour. If you live alone, then, then you can start a video chat with one of your family members while you're eating. See if you can ask them, hey, we're gonna eat together at seven o'clock. I'm so glad that I don't have to talk about substance abuse today because we know that destroys your body. We know that shortens your lifespan. We know that destroys your quality of life. We know that foreign objects will destroy your body. There was one time when I put uh, kerosene in my car on accident and it ran, but it ran like a lawnmower, but it still started up every day and it still ran, but it ran horribly. So you, you can abuse your body with unhealthy things today, but what about the long-term effects? See, there, there aren't any conclusive concrete studies that show vegetarians live longer, but the Bible is clear that God wants us to eat properly. He wants us to eat properly prepared meat. All right, Romans 14, three says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him with eat, which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God has received him. So the scriptures are clear that we shouldn't be trying to make a meat eater feel bad or judge a, very a vegetarian if that's their choice or if that's their doctor's recommendation. But the Bible does allow for you to eat meat if you eat it properly. But even if you are a meat eater, I think we can all agree to increase the green stuff in our life. And I know we don't want to do it. I don't like vegetables either, but we, we need it. We can all use more fruits and vegetables. Post pandemic, we can all see the importance of a stronger immune system, especially in America. We can all benefit. We can all benefit from choosing a, a little bit better when we go to the grocery store. We can go for the organic option. It costs a little bit more, but what exactly? I need to know what exactly does pesticide, and we don't know which pesticide is on which fruit, but I need to know exactly what does that particular pesticide on that particular fruit do to your body. When you deal with biblical principles, you notice the contrast in worldly principles. They, never, they almost never work, and they often, almost all the time, include what becomes social norms. So for example, if you vacuum it out your car and you find a french fry in your car under the seat and you realize, you know what, I haven't been to McDonald's in three months. How is that french fry in pristine condition? It might have started as a potato, but what did they do to it? What did they add to it? What exactly is a preservative? What exactly is that preservative? How many preservatives? What happens when you mix those preservatives together? What happens when you mix those preservatives together with your medication or what, what you ate yesterday? We don't know what these preservatives are. We don't know what these things are. And our bodies are not designed to properly digest preservatives and artificial foods. And you ever notice they never ever tell you what exactly makes that artificial thing. Red dye number 40, they don't tell you what that is or what's inside of it. But what, what, you, what you do know, or what we should know, if you look up what artificial means, it means not real. It means this food is not real. Your body is designed for food. So that's why organic is, is the best option. It also is the best option to avoid GMOs. So there were some studies, and you can look these up now. There's some studies where squirrels won't even eat the GMO corn. They prefer the natural corn. You see, even animals know better. That's why animals smell their food first. Because if it doesn't smell natural, they'd rather just go hungry. That's why we should eat what God created. That's why we should eat natural foods. That's why we should avoid natural, uh, unnatural flavors. That's why we should avoid artificial flavors. Do you know the qualification for artificial flavor? The qualification for something that's an artificial flavor is it cannot have anything natural in it. It cannot be natural. It cannot have any natural ingredients. That's the qualification for, for artificial flavors that we're putting in our bodies. And it's actually not hard to eliminate act, uh, artificial flavors from your diet because my family has been doing it for years. It's not hard at all. Have you ever looked, if you, don't, if you have a moment, take a moment and look up the ingredients for things like cereal in the U.S. compared to other countries. So go get your favorite cereal and look at the ingredients on the box, go online, 
or you can do both online and look up the ingredients for that same cereal in the UK or Australia or other countries and tell me why there's 50 ingredients compared to maybe five ingredients in the uh, in the next in another country. What what are these things? These are the words that we can't even pronounce. The Bible says eat process bleach modified sugar, right? No, it says eat thou honey because it's good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to the taste. Why does the Bible tell you to eat honey? Because honey is natural. The Bible never tell you to eat something unnatural. Why, why does our people rule the world for getting our foot cut off? What race has the highest blood pressure? Highest cholesterol? Who, who in our race doesn't know somebody in their family that's on insulin? What if we followed the do's and the don'ts that God gave us? What if we followed the do's and the don'ts that God gave us for our own benefit, for his own temple? What's for dinner tonight? Hamburger, french fries at 10 o'clock at night, then you go to bed, then you call your pastor and ask him to pray for you because you got high blood pressure. Then you come down to the altar and ask him prayer because your cholesterol is up, the sugar is down. When was the last time you jogged? Can you try to walk around the block, especially after you eat? Can we drink a little bit more water because your organs actually need it? This year, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to pick three of these four things. If you watch it today, I want you to vow that you will take three of these things and you will, will make a commitment to do that. So get some steps in or cut the days and the amount of alcohol you drink or drink some water in the morning when you wake up and stop smoking. Figure out a way to quit smoking. This is, this is so your loved ones can enjoy you longer. This is so you can have a, a healthier life longer. Who wants to be old and unhealthy? Don't you want to be old, grow old, and be healthy? Each one of these things will improve your quality of life dramatically. So I'm not asking you to go get a gym membership. I'm not asking you to do anything drastic, but can you take some stairs sometimes? Every now and again? Can you park in the farthest spot of the mall every now and again? Instead, instead of eating when you're bored, how about you go to the mall and you start at one corner store, the anchor store, and you walk all the way to the corner of the other part of the mall? Just do that once a week. Or here's a challenge. How about once a week you touch two mailboxes in the same day? Go outside, touch the mailbox, go find another mailbox, touch that mailbox, and come back home. It's a nice challenge for you, 2023. Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4, verse 3 says, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. See, this is the scripture that Christians use. They use this erroneously to make you think you can eat anything or you can eat everything. Does that even sound right? God has restrictions on everything. There's even a commandment to wash your hands before you eat. How does he not care all of a sudden what you put in his temple? When did that happen? Show me the scripture where God said, I don't care what you eat. So, all right, let's, let's go to the scripture and see if it makes any sense. It says, every creature is good, nothing to be refused. Okay. Verse 3 says, forbidding to marry. So, should we stop getting married and teach people to continue in fornication? What, what does commanding... To not eat meat even meat. Should we eat it or not? Watch, watch this. Here's the slick part. God created. It says God created to be received with thanksgiving. Okay. Good. Got it. No problem. Thank God for my food. No problem. But don't ignore when it says of them. Of them which believe and know the truth. Why do you always exclude that part? Why do you take that part John 17, 17 tells you what the truth is. It says, sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is the truth. The word of God is the truth. So them that know the truth. Paul is dealing with those that already know the truth. He's talking to people that already know the truth. God is dealing with people that already know the word of God. That's why Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean. Then the Lord took him and he showed him. I wasn't talking about food. I was talking about the northern ten tribes, not animals. That's why Peter went to the northern tribes. He didn't go and go eat a pork, a, a pork chop. 
So God does care what we eat. It says which God has created to be received. What are the animals God has created to be received? Why did we just overlook that? God never created unclean animals to be received. You simply need to know the truth. When did he stop caring about his temple? What day, what scripture? Show me when God didn't stop caring about his temple. When did he make it okay to slowly destroy it? Did you know even catching a common cold, there's ways to prevent that? I'm not the only one that went years without catching a cold before. People figured out how to do it. Why take days off work? Why miss out with fun with the family? Why, why make your family sick? Why lose your taste buds? There's ways to prevent unnecessary sickness. There's ways to prevent unnecessary disease. The Bible is clearly on our side. The Bible is matched out with do's and don'ts, things that we should do, things that we shouldn't do. For example, not stuffing your belly until you burp and then go to sleep. You should never eat until you're stuffed because all you're doing is stretching your stomach. And when you stretch your stomach now, you'll be able to eat more food next time. And then next time you'll be able to eat more food. And then next time you'll be wondering, how did I get this big old belly? Because you keep stretching your stomach every night. So have some self-control. Stop going to buffets. A, a good rule is to have your meat portion and your sides portions, the size of a deck of cards. Why are we doing that? The Bible says, Proverbs 25, 16, has thou found honey? What does it say? Eat only enough. The Bible is clear that he doesn't want us overeating, overindulging. Eating at home is a benefit all by itself because the Bible says better is a dinner of herbs where love is. Where is love? Should be in your home. Did you notice it says a dinner of herbs? Where does herbs come from? Herbs are natural. Does God want us eating artificial food or does he want us eating natural herbs? God doesn't want us to be an ultra carnivore either. Just because you can't eat meat doesn't mean you should go crazy with eating meat. There should be some variety on your plate. And you don't have to be a nutritional expert. But why I get a big slab of ribs, a full slab of ribs with a, with a side of barbecue drumsticks and, and a thigh and a hot dog? What's wrong, with, what's wrong with having a little salad for dinner every now and again? The Bible says in Ecclesiasticus 30, is that 37, 29? The Bible says, don't be greedy with meats. The Bible says, don't hang out with wine bibbers or, or with right, righteous eaters of the flesh. God doesn't want you to exercise not having self-control. God wants you to be in control. God wants you to be in control of what you put in your body, should I say. God wants you to exercise self-control. Be in control of yourself. If you cannot limit yourself, for example, to a small glass of wine every now and again, then don't drink at all. It's not for you. And remember, the Bible does say strong drink is raging. Verse 21 says, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. And you know, gluttony is one of the seven deadly sins. So exercise some self-control. Figure out how much you're going to eat, especially when you go out. If you go out to dinner at a restaurant, already have in your mind that you're going to be asking the server for a take-home tray. Don't, you don't have to eat all of it. Save some for tomorrow. And who ever said that you have to eat three times a day? Where did that come from? Is that the Bible? And Moses said, this shall be. When the Lord shall give you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread. Oh, by the way, the next scripture says, uh, your murmurings aren't against us. The murmurs aren't against the men of God, but your murmuring, your complaining is against the Lord. I'm just throwing it. Now they are, they're showing, they, they're people who have figured out, there's uh, smart people, scientists and doctors and nutritionists, they figured out that it's a benefit for intermittent fasting. They figured out that fasting was beneficial to you. They figured out that the portion of your brain that you use when you pray is more activity in that area of your brain when you fast. Look at that. And they found that the intermittent fasting, is, it has so many benefits. It gives you the organs a chance to stop working for a while and recuperate and get your cells uh, renewed. So I'm not trying to give you some new uh, weight loss program or some new fad. I'm trying to make you whole inside and out. Waking up in the morning when your organs are not even, uh, not even woke yet, when your organs are not even ready yet, and eating a steak and eggs is not a good idea. 
even if you ate lunch, which I, I think should be something really small, a small snack, an apple or a banana or something. I think lunch should be something small. But what's wrong with this meal plan right here? What's wrong with this? There's no artificial flavors. There's no artificial anything. There's no GMOs. It's not too heavy on the meat. It's got a good mixture of fruit and vegetables and protein. You don't have to eat exactly this, but this is just an example. What if you just ate that? Even if you took the lunch out and replaced it with those fruit, what, what's wrong with eating something like that? Imagine you're in church and someone comes to the altar for prayer. Di doctor diagnosed them with lung cancer, but their breath smell like cigarettes and swishers. Yeah. Or imagine you're in church and someone wants prayer for liver disease, but they drink every night. We know those things damage your body. But what's in that fast food you just ordered? What, they're, they're bringing your food right now. What's in it? How is it processed? What preservatives did they add to it? When you go to the restaurant, when was that animal killed? How long ago was that hamburger bun break, baked? When did they bake the hamburger bun? So nobody knows. It, again, I'm reiterating, it's a bit good idea to learn how to cook and eat at home. Or eat at home more and eat out less. And learn to cook these days is easy because you can just go on YouTube and learn how to cook pretty much every item out there. The Bible says drink out of your own cisterns and running water out of your own well. Eat at home with your family, prepare some meals together, crack some jokes, hang out. It's good for you. In addition to what we eat, it's important when and how we eat. It's just as important. Why wake up and break your fast with an unnatural substance? Why start off your day with an unnatural substance? Why break your fast with that? The first thing you put in your body, really? Nobody knows what the long-term effects of this stuff is. Water should be the first thing you eat after you break your fast every morning. Not greasy eggs and, and sugar-filled coffee. Same thing at lunch or dinner. What, what happens if you take some grease, pour it down the sink, and then run cold water? If you did that, it's gonna cost you about $200 because the plumber has to come out and clean that grease out. So what happens if you eat greasy food and drink a cold pot? Instead of drinking chamomile tea or hot cocoa for dinner, and occasionally some room temperature wine. But all I'm asking is when you're eating, just tell them to hold the ice. When you're eating or drinking anything, especially meat, especially red meat, What's included in the do's and the don'ts that God gave us? What are the best practices for foods according to scripture? So I want to simply answer three questions today. Three quick questions. Can we eat organs? That answer can save your life. Are God's chosen people that he dwells in allowed to eat blood? Are God's chosen people who are the literal temple of God, are we allowed to eat fat? All right, let's start with that. Leviticus 3, 7, 3, 17 says, it shall be a perpetual, perpetual statue for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. When does the word perpetual mean? Okay, you can do it today. Perpetual means forever. Perpetual means always. Throughout your generations means this applies to us today and my grandkids that don't even exist yet. God knows why. He also knows how he created every single animal. And he told Noah to take how many animals on the ark? If you say two, then you have not read the Bible. Because the Bible says he told Noah to take seven clean animals and take two of every unclean animal, the kind of animal. Okay, that's the Bible. My question is, how did no one know which animals were clean and unclean? Because when we read Leviticus, where the law is about clean and unclean animals, that didn't exist yet. The scriptures about which animals not to eat came way later by Moses, who wasn't even born yet. So how did no one know which animals are clean and which are unclean? God created certain animals with certain purposes. He created certain animals to clean the earth. He has scavengers to clean dead animals on the earth. He has bottom feeders, bottom feeder fish to eat poop. And some of those fish, some of them, they eat algae. He even created fish that eat dead skin from off your feet, from off your heel. 
those animals are not for consumption. It's just simple as that. God didn't create those animals that's eating dirt and doo-doo and foot skin for you to eat. Because what happens when you eat it? Here, the man of God is explaining that God has given him certain knowledge to know how the world was made and how all the stars operate. In the wisdom of Solomon, chapter is that chapter 1 or 7? 7. Seven, In chapter 7, verse 20, he says, He gave him the knowledge of the nature of living creatures, the different types of plants. He knew to stay away from poison, poison ivy because he taught him that. And he gave him those instructions to put in the Bible so we would know that. And he knew the benefits of eating certain roots. That's what the Bible says. So now they tell us to buy a product to spray on the dandelions. Okay. And the product, the unnatural spray that you just sprayed on the dandelions kills you. And it kills the dandelion that the da and the dandelion is what is supposed to be saving your life. They just found out that there's huge benefits for dandelions. And we're spraying stuff on the dandelions to kill you. That's why we need to stick with the wisdom of the Bible. You, you kill yourself, killing your own natural medicine that, grow, that it grows in your backyard for free. And you're paying somebody to give you something that's killing you to kill, the, to kill your own medicine, your, your own natural medicine. Would you ever? I don't think you would ever eat a poisonous snake. Would you ever eat a poisonous frog? God color codes spiders. You know why? You know why God color codes snakes? And frogs in the jungle? Because he's a nice guy. He does that so we know which ones to watch out for. He did the same thing with animals. So we know which ones we should eat. There is a difference between unclean animals meant to clean the earth and clean animals that we can eat. The Bible says to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. This is something that we're supposed to know from the wisdom of the Bible. So I, I know that there's Christians that think, oh, that's Old Testament. Don't worry about that. God changed all that. Peter had a dream. Don't worry about it. Okay, so why in Acts 15, way after God was crucified, way after God was raised from the dead, why is there still a dietary law that says you must avoid meats offered to idols and avoid blood and avoid animals strangled. It says, if you do this, you should do well. Why are we still talking about foods? Why does it seem like that's an important thing to God? Why in the book of Acts is there a commandment to stay away from pollution of idols? Got it. No problem. Stay away from idols. No, no, no problem. It also says avoid fornication. That's masturbation and any other uh, forbidden sexual acts. No problem. Got it. But when it says, once again, from things strangled and from blood, we think God don't care what he eat. What we eat, right? We can't do whatever we want. My body belongs to God. There are still rules concerning what we eat and how we prepare it. Like not eating meats with blood in it. This isn't for everybody, okay? That's why everybody don't suffer the same way from not obeying this. Did you notice that? That's why we rule the world for getting our foot cut off. That's why our number one cause of death is heart disease. And heart disease is literally, could be literally caused by some of the foods that the Bible says don't eat. Some of the foods the Bible says don't eat is extremely high in sodium, extremely high in cholesterol. As a matter of fact, if you take all of the foods that God said don't eat and check the sodium content and check the cholesterol content, you'll be like, wait a minute, there's a correlation here. There's a reason God don't want us eating this stuff. And if we do eat this stuff, just imagine the problems that we would no longer have. Ezekiel 44. And they shall teach my people, verse 23, the difference, teach my people. God says he wants his people to know the difference between the holy and the profane. And cause them who? God's people to discern between the unclean and the clean. That's not just meats, by the way. There's people too. God's people must be taught what is clean and unclean so we'll know the difference. I thought it doesn't matter. thought it doesn't matter. What are some of the things that provoke God to anger? Let's read Isaiah 65. A people that provoked me to anger continually to my face. This is a future prophecy. 
Read the entire chapter. I don't have time to go through the entire chapter right now and tell me if this, ha if this happened already. This is future prophecy. This is right before the new heaven and the new earth. This scripture includes today. It says there's a people that sacrifice it, sacrificing in the garden and burning incense upon altars of bricks. So here Isaiah is looking into the future and he sees people is doing this. Is this what will anger God? Sacrificing and burning? Okay, let's see. What, how about verse 4? Which remains among the graves and lodge in the monuments. Okay, not a problem. Which eats swine's flesh. Who are these people that's eating swine's flesh that's provoking God to anger? And broth of abominable things in their vessels. They're, they're, they're making a, a pot full of abominable animals. Why is there still abominations in the future? Why is the text talking about abominations in the future? I thought that was done away with. So let's go to the next prophetic uh, chapter. The next chapter, verse, uh, is a chapter 66, 17 says, They that sanctify themselves, he's seeing some more people, and purifying themselves in the gardens behind a tree in the midst. I see them. They're eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse. They shall be consumed together, says who? Says the Lord. I thought God doesn't care what we eat. I, I really thought the New Testament means we can eat whatever we want. Okay, so why is there a judgment for those eating swine flesh and mouse? Because there's a commandment not to do it. Why is there still such a thing as an abomination in the future? This is the prophet Isaiah telling you what's going to happen. And I know, I know everybody won't make amendments to their diet. I know that. Or this scripture wouldn't exist. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Read verse 15. It literally says, this is going to happen when the Lord returns with fire and anger and a whirlwind. Has that happened yet? No. This is future tense. This is a future prophecy. How do you disobey the word of God to the glory of God? How do you do that? How do you obey the word of God to the glory of God? You just follow the scriptures. It says, whether therefore you eat or drink. Why is it still talking about food? Why does God even care about what we eat or drink? He says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So I have a question. How do you eat or drink so God gets the glory? You obey his word. You don't say grace over abominations. You learn the difference between clean and unclean. And you thank God for the knowledge and, and you thank God for caring about our health. How are you going to bless a mess? How are you going to bless an abomination? Have you ever seen a label that says grass-fed pork? You've never seen that. You only see grass-fed beef. You'll see uh, grass-fed lamb or goat. Because these animals generally, these animals generally eat grass exclusively. Okay? That cow can take that grass, pass it through four stomachs before making a substance <laughs> called manure that works great, wonderfully on plants. Okay? You know which animal you cannot use their manure for plants? Yeah. God labeled clean animals just like he did those poisonous spiders and poisonous frogs. So we know not to eat them. Animals with cloven hoofs. He, he color-coded the, the spider. He made a, a clear distinction on which ones you can go near. He's making a clear distinction on which animals you can eat. The ones that eat grass exclusively and the ones that eat it in a certain way, the ones that chew the cud, the ones that regurgitate it and chew it again and put it in another stomach, those are the ones that you can eat. Those are the ones that are healthy. Those are the ones that's not an abomination. God has a special people. And that's who I'm talking to today. He designed a poisonous frog a certain way. He designed his chosen people a certain way. Our bodies are made a certain way. And we need to recognize he's not trying to ruin our lives, but he's trying to protect us. Deuteronomy says, you shall not eat of anything that died by itself. You can give it, it says shall, you shall give it to the stranger that's in your gates, that they can eat it, or they may sell it, or you may sell it to an alien. Because you are a holy people unto the Lord thy God. So God tells you clearly not to eat animals that died on its own, but then he shows you that you, child of God, are special. God calls you holy. If you are holy, there are things you simply don't do. 
I know people are, are in deep into zodiac signs, but that's not today's lesson. We're not talking about that today. Today, I want to show you the wisdom that's found in the Bible. The wisdom that's found in Leviticus 19 says, you shall not eat anything with the blood. Who is he talking to? God's chosen people. Neither shall you use enchantments, nor observe times. So if you're going to throw this scripture out, then it's okay to practice fortune telling and witchcraft. Right? Do whatever you want. Eat whatever you want. You have free will. But if the Bible says don't do it, I'd rather be dead wrong and not eat blood or unclean animals. Look at what we're talking about. Look at what we're discussing. We have to challenge people not to eat blood. We have to challenge people not to eat unclean animals and fat. We have to challenge people not to eat animals that drop dead and you don't even know what killed it. You see how far we've gotten away from God's natural design? That our minds are twisted. And certain things that should just be naturally make sense. Yeah. Nine, said, uh, chapter 9, verse 10. This is my third, this is the answer to my third question. But the fat and the kidneys, organ, and the fatty part of, that's above the liver, organ, or the, of the sin offering, he burnt it upon the altar. He did not eat it. As the Lord commanded. Who commanded? The Lord commanded. So I want to thank Deacon Sakari because I did not know that uh, a polar bear liver can kill you. I did not know that. I had to look that up and I'm like, I, I just chopped. It's so toxic that one ounce of it will take you out. So if you're stranded on a, on a if we're both stranded on an island, for example, and the island only has uh, polar bears, you know, I, I would live because I vow to follow the word of God. If you don't have the wisdom of the word and you eat that liver, hey, praise the Lord. We actually have a meal plan that we use monthly. If you'd like to join us in, in preparation or if you want some biblical recipe ideas, let us know. I'm so glad you watched this video. It's okay if I, is it okay if I teach sometimes? Is it okay if I try to help the total man and offer a well-rounded ministry that benefits God's people? Click like for me. Click like. Go ahead. Click like if this was a benefit to you. I'm trying. I'm tired of seeing God's people sick, struggling, and suffering, especially when there's simple things that we can do, simple changes that we can make. Can you vow to make some simple adjustments? Even if you just vow to start your day with a glass of water, just do that. Just do one of the three things, one of the four things, do three of the four things would be great. But if you can just do one, that'd be perfect. So stay tuned. Next Friday, I got a powerful message. I need y'all prayers. Um, YouTube will display a notify me button. So go ahead and click that notify me button. So you'll be notified when we go live. And please subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you all for coming. Praise